right, here's my kickoff question for all of you. Have you ever had a that could have been so bad kind of moment? Do you know what I mean by that? It means exactly what it says. A time that had the potential to turn out awful. And I mean awful in a way that would have completely changed your life for the worse. If you live long enough, you will experience this. So let me give you an example. Every year around Thanksgiving, we go to my wife's parents, which means that we drive from central Minnesota to eastern South Dakota. And if you know the route and geography, you may know that the route is not great, especially in November weather. There is a magical line along the way right after you drive out of the snow and before you drive into the rain that is nothing but ice. And it does not even have to be um, raining. I mean, did you know that there is such a thing as freezing fog? I mean, I didn't until I drove through South Dakota. <laughs> anyway, uh, one year we are making the Minnesota to South Dakota trek and hit this zone of ice in the fog and traffic comes to a quick stop. Not to say that I'm an awesome driver, but well, hmm. I'm an awesome driver. Uh, I left enough room to be able to stop before rear-ending the person in front of me. But tell me, what do you do right after you stop suddenly on the interstate? You look in the rear of your mirror, right? You see what's coming behind you? And I do that, and I look behind me, and coming out of the fog, I see the worst thing I think I could possibly see at that moment. A semi-truck that is in the process of jackknifing. And as he is skidding off the road, his trailer comes around and just misses us, just misses us by like 10 feet. 10 feet more and we would have been taken out. 10 feet more and a semi-trailer would have crashed into our car in such a way that I am certain we would not have walked away unscathed from. Oh, that could have been so bad. I'm pretty sure that could have been so bad moments are a universal human experience that spans time and place. And often what is considered to be the worst thing that could happen to you is determined by culture. Our focus text today is about Hannah, a biblical character who is introduced as a woman who is experiencing the worst thing that could have ever happened to a woman in her time and culture. She cannot have a child. She suffers from infertility. Obviously, I don't know what that's like, and I won't even pretend to know. I can't speak to the experience. But what I can tell you is that in the ancient world, to, to be a childless woman was the worst thing that could happen to you. It was shameful. It meant that something was fundamentally wrong with you, and Hannah was ridiculed for it. Hannah grows desperate enough to try anything, and at a place of worship, a temple to the Lord, she prays and tries to make a deal with God, which is exactly what desperate people do. As the story is told, the Lord hears her, and she conceives a son. And, and in her relief, I can hear her say in her own language the same thing that I said on a South Dakota interstate. That could have been so bad. Hannah prayed and said, My heart exalts in the Lord. My strength is exalted in my God. My mouth derides my enemies because I rejoice in your victory. There is no holy one like the Lord, no one besides you. There is no rock like our God. Talk no more so very proudly. Let not arrogance come from your mouth. For the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty are broken, but the feeble gird on strength. Those who were full have hired themselves out for bread. Those who were hungry are fat with spoil. The barren has borne seven, but she who has many children is forlorn. The Lord kills and brings life. The Lord brings down to Sheol and raises up. The Lord makes poor and, ri and makes rich. He brings low, he also exalts. He raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes and inherit a seat of honor. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's and on them he has set the world. He will guard the feet of his faithful ones, but the wicked will perish in darkness. 
for not by might does one prevail. The Lord, his adversaries will be shattered. The Most High will thunder in heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the power of his anointed. The focus text that we read is, is called Hannah's Song. I mean, it's a, it's a Hebrew poem. Um, it's gratitude in, in the form of poetry to the gift that she has been given. But what happens next in the story is just weird. After her, that could have been so bad moment, out of her gratitude, she, uh, she generously offers her son to the Lord, which means that she gives him up to live at the temple, to be raised as a servant to the Lord. Now, we don't have any cultural reference for this, and it sounds just bizarre. And when I first remember reading this story years ago, I was like, oh great, here we go. Another bizarre biblical story lost to the ancient world. That was until a jackknife semi narrowly missed killing my family on a South Dakota interstate. After I breathed a sigh of relief and said to myself, that could have been so bad, I experienced a kind of gratitude that I have never had before. And it was weird because this gratitude that I was experiencing was begging for a response of appreciation and generosity equal to the gift I received. At that moment, I was open to things that I never would think about doing before. If my kids would have said to me at that time, Dad, we almost died. We should celebrate by getting horses. I would have been like, yeah, yes, we should. I love you guys, you can have anything you want. If Emily would have said to me, life is short, let's ditch my parents and go to Hawaii tonight, I would have said, oh, that's the best thing I've ever heard. Actually, I probably would have said that even if we didn't almost die. <laughs> but, but seriously, in all seriousness, I learned on the side of the road in South Dakota, looking at a wrecked semi-truck, that profound gratitude leads to profound generosity because when you receive a gift that is really really good you can't help but share it hannah's story made much more sense after that yes we're from different times and cultures and worlds but you know what on some level i get it and i think you do too think about the good parts of social media not the algorithms that feed you extreme content to keep you engaged or the negative interactions, but, but the, um, the content that comes from people's lives. When something good happens, when your kids do something fantastic, when you accomplish a major achievement, when you get a new puppy for crying out loud, what do you do? Well, you post it on your social media accounts. You share it with your family and friends because whether you admit it or not, you are grateful for those things and you wanna share the joy that they bring uh, with others. I mean, I'm just beginning to figure out that generosity flows from gratitude. I'll be honest, I often do things because I feel like I have to because I feel a sense of obligation. If I don't say yes to someone's request for help, especially if I'm connected to that person, I just feel guilty. So I often find myself packed full, but my, my life is packed full, but it doesn't feel good. It feels like I'm living out of obligation and I don't do obligation very well. It's not that obligations are bad, some things that you have to do, you just have to do, but too much obligation in life makes what we do feel forced, feel lifeless, feel dead. That's why when parents tell their kids that they should do something without any other reason attached to it, it becomes an obligation and it becomes lifeless. I believe strongly that God cares about what we do and about the decisions we make. I believe God cares about the life we live. I grew up hearing religion, faith, and spirituality paired with obligatory language. Chad, you should go to church. 
Chad, you should uh, be generous. Chad, you should care for, watch out for the person who lives next door to you. And I guess, yeah, I, I should do those things. But I also believe that God cares about why we do those things. I believe that God wants the best possible life for all of us and for our world, which means that I think God calls us to move beyond obligation. It's like getting a present for your spouse and he or she opens the gift and it is perfect. It is a thoughtful, beautiful, generous gift and it makes the person's day. And then the person who gave the gift says, yeah, I had to. You needed it. You've been annoying the last few days and I saw this on clearance and ah, I thought I'd get it for you. I mean, if you are the person who receives that gift, you don't want that anymore. And if you are the person who gave it with that mentality, I, I mean, it feels empty. There is no life in this. How much of what you do is obligation? God wants our lives to be so much more than that more than obligation. God calls us to live with generosity that comes out of gratitude, not because God says we should, but because we see our life as a gift. God does not want your obligation. God wants your heart to live and to give out of a sense of gratitude. Sometimes it takes a that could have been so much worse moment for us to see that. And while we are not going to give away our firstborn child like Hannah, we can begin to move ever closer to finding the life that comes from giving out of a sense of gratitude. And this is the good news that we hear today. Thanks be to God for that. Amen. After hearing the focus text today and the reflection on that text, we have a couple of questions for you to help you go deeper into the story and apply it more to your everyday living. Question number one, have you had a that could have been so bad moment in your life? Think about that. What, what would it be? And number two, how much of what you do each day is driven by obligation? 